The scientists announced Tuesday that they have, for the first time, produced more energy in a fusion reaction that was used to ignite in a major breakthrough, decade-long quest to harness the process that powers the sun. Researchers at this Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California achieved the result last week. It's known as a net energy gain. The goal has been elusive because fusion happens at such a high temperature and pressure that it's incredibly difficult to control. Certainly a major breakthrough in the science and we heard from the Department of Energy earlier today. And just a little bit ago, I spoke with Dan Clark. He's a physicist at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I want to take us out to that conversation with the scientist that was a part of this breakthrough for fusion. To live now from Fox, I am Andy Mack. Obviously, a big breakthrough today, and we're joined by now Dan Clark out there in the Livermore National Laboratory. You're a physicist out there, Dan. Uh, tell me a little bit about what we had. What was the breakthrough today? And and give me a little bit of an insight into just what this breakthrough means. Right. Well, it's it's a pleasure to be here, and it's obviously an exciting day for us. Uh, the the breakthrough, as it were, to be precise, actually occurred a week ago when the uh, experimental result actually happened. It was the first time ever in the laboratory that we demonstrated more fusion energy output from an experiment, a fusion experiment, than energy input. Uh, so here at the National, uh, Ignition, National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, we use a laser system to energize a target. We put 2.1 megajoules of laser energy into that target, and it produced a little over 3 megajoules of fusion energy output, so 50% uh, more energy out than we put in, which was the first time that has ever been demonstrated in the lab. So that's incredibly exciting for us. And as for where it goes from here, uh, well, again, that, that's a very exciting prospect. You know, in the near term, what we want to do, we're scientists, so we want to repeat our scientific discoveries. So we're going to try and, and do that a second time and a third time. Uh, but looking further out, we want to try to develop targets uh, for this laser system that are, are more efficient, more powerful. Uh, and can potentially take us to even higher energy uh, fusion output uh, in the hopefully the not too distant future. And when you see a moment like this, and obviously doing research and, and doing all of these sort of tests uh, leading up to this moment, when you see the breakthrough, is it a surprise moment? Is it an excitement moment? Kind of, do, do we know what this could mean moment? Uh, well, it's certainly an excitement moment. Uh, it's it's hard to overstate how exciting this is is for us especially for all the people, and it's a very, very large team that have been working on this for so many years, literally decades, uh, we've been working towards a moment like this. Uh, so I can't say there was necessarily a surprise. It's always a bit of a surprise when you get a, a really good result uh, like this. But going into this experiment, we had good reason to believe that it, that it would be successful. We've been sort of building to this stepwise. So it wasn't a complete surprise, uh, but at a personal level, it certainly was a bit of a surprise and certainly a lot of excitement for us and exciting, as I said, for where we could potentially go from here uh, to even higher performance yet uh, using the same sort of techniques that brought us this kind of success. And you mentioned the decade long process and decades long process that Absolutely. this moment, this breakthrough moment could have. Uh, take me back through the journey. I mean, how much has science come along? How much has this technology come along to allow a moment like this to happen? Oh, that, that's a very long story and it long predates my time in the field. Uh, but I guess the, the shortest answer is that the, the really roots of this go back almost a century now uh, to the realization that fusion was the energy source that powers the stars that warm the earth and light up the night sky. Uh, and sort of during the time frame of World War II, uh, when nuclear weapons were developed, it was sort of realized that that could be harnessed, first obviously for military purposes. Uh, but even in that time frame, there was, you know, the gleam and the dream of having fusion energy be a beneficent force, uh, a way to gen uh, generate energy for our homes and for cities. And that's been a sort of twinkle in the eye of scientists for 60, 70 years now. And over those many decades, we've built a lot of experimental facilities, predecessors to the National Ignition Facility here at Lawrence Livermore and other facilities across the world. And they've been making incremental steps over all those decades. It's been a very long haul, but in the last decade, the National Ignition Facility started doing target experiments. And uh, initially we had some troubles with those, but we learned from those, we overcame those challenges. And finally, we're, we're here to this break even point where we're finally getting more energy out than we put into the target. And like I say, exciting prospects come after that. So it's like you say, a very, very long decades long experience with thousands of people involved. And we're all just very excited to celebrate that together. 
you mentioned the incremental changes that it took to get up to this moment. Now, probably, there are going to be incremental moments after this to make it on a large scale, a, a function that can power different sort of things, like you mentioned with houses. Uh, what comes now, now that we know we can do this, how do those incremental steps kind of fall into place? Right, so I guess I'd have to emphasize again, this was the essential step, right? This is the, the entry point scientific demonstration that it is possible to do this. You know, without that, you, you have nothing effectively. So we finally made that, that transition to the, the possible state. What comes after that, like I say for us, you know, in the here and now, as it were, it's repetition, demonstrating we understand what's going on, demonstrating that we can repeat it reliably and effectively. Uh, and then you start thinking about what the next uh, big step could be. And we already have some ideas on our drawing boards, as it were, uh, to look at targets that would be more efficient, using the same amount of laser energy to get even more fusion out. Uh, targets that would be more robust and reliable, that is that we could always get the same amount of energy out. Uh, other uh, improvements like that, targets that would go to even higher compressions than the very extreme compressions that we achieved on this experiment that potentially would be more efficient and give us higher yields. And then if you start to think into the fusion energy space, which is again that, that dream that we all have gleaming in our eyes, well, that's taking what we've done, demonstrated once here uh, in the past week or so, and scale that up to do it many, many times faster and with many, many more times the amount of energy coming out. And then on top of that, there are a number of technological things that you need to imagine to have that sort of industrial scale application. Uh, but if you're willing to entertain ideas on the decade time scale, I, I think we can all have that in the offing. I think a, a lot of people can be optimistic when a bunch of big breakthrough happens. So it's hard not to be optimistic uh, when something like this happens. I, I want to talk a little bit more conceptually about it because one of the big things is I believe there is no waste when it comes to something like this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because when people think of like nuclear and stuff, they have to think about waste. That's not the same with something like this, correct? Uh, that, that's absolutely right. This is, again, part of the, the really attractive thing about fusion energy. The fuel that goes into our fusion experiments is essentially hydrogen. Uh, you can get it out of seawater. Uh, it's, it's, it's everywhere in the world. And what comes out of it essentially is helium. You fuse the hydrogen together and you make helium. In a typical fission reactor, like the nuclear power that we know today, you put in uranium and you get out fission waste, which some fraction of that is very radioactive. Uh, it's a challenge to store and to deal with that, and obviously people are concerned about the radiological hazard that that poses. Uh, but with us, uh, it's literally hydrogen from seawater goes in and helium comes out as the byproduct of the fusion reaction, and we get a tremendous amount of energy along the way. Uh, so as far as uh, the nuclear hazard, the nuclear waste, it's, it's orders of magnitude different if you work in the fusion space uh, than you do in the fission space. But as we know, uh, it's been a long way to get here. It's much more challenging to make that work, and we still have a ways to go to make that any sort of reality. And the Livermore National Laboratory, where you're at in California, you are the one that made this breakthrough. But there are plenty of other laboratories around the country, including in California and other different places, that, that work amongst this, under this umbrella of the Department of Energy. How integral are this web of labs around the country, around the world, to, to make this happen? Yeah, I think that's a, a great point, and I want to emphasize again, it, it is a huge team of people, many different institutions over many, many years that have, have worked together to make this, this possible. And as far as the other national labs are concerned, we do collaborate closely with them and have for, again, literally decades, our colleagues at Los Alamos, our colleagues at Sandia, at uh, the University of Rochester in New York State, uh, at Princeton University, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a number of other academic institutions have all played integral roles over many years in the type of experiments we're talking about here. And I should also say we've also worked with a number of international collaborators as well in the UK in France, uh, and France and in Asia who have all sort of helped in their own way in, in pushing this forward and are pursuing similar lines of research. So it is a national undertaking. It's the National Ignition Facility, and we shouldn't forget uh, the participation of all those different teams in it. Definitely. It's definitely a big team effort. And Dan Clark, the physicist there at the Livermore Lab, the national lab that make this breakthrough. Uh, you talked so much about all of this that happens. When you go to work tomorrow, what's it going to be like? Are we just kind of working toward the next step? Well, it's time to, to dust off the chalkboard and think up some new ideas and, and see what ways we can, can push this a little bit further. Obviously, we're eager to see uh, the next thing we can do. And, you know, as 
this is a, a recent breakthrough. The shot, uh, the experiment happened only a week ago. So, you know, the data in a way is still coming in and we're, we're still trying to understand what that is teaching us. It's pretty clear it was a big improvement in the fusion performance, but we want to understand the details of how that came to pass. Uh, and, and so we've got some more analysis to do there, but obviously everybody's eager to look ahead to the next thing that we could possibly do. All right, Dan Clark there, the physicist at the National Livermore Lab. Thank you again for joining us here on Live Now from Vox. And well, congratulations. I think uh, that is in order as well. So I appreciate your time and uh, I appreciate all the work that you've done. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure.